Hi, my name is Kirk Santor, and along with Brian Onsbach, Brendan Benoit, and Ryan Benoit, we will be discussing current solar cells and how polymer materials can improve both the efficiency and lifespan of solar cells. I'm going to discuss current solar cells and how solar cells work. Brian is going to discuss polymer solar cell efficiency. Ryan is going to talk about polymer solar cell stability and Brendan is going to discuss the advantages and disadvantages as well as future applications of polymer solar cell technology. The key concept behind why solar panels can create electricity is the photovoltaic effect. The photovoltaic effect is the creation of voltage or electric current in a material upon exposure to light. Essentially the process of turning energy of, from photons of light into electric energy. This phenomenon was first demonstrated by French physicist Edmond Becquerel in 1839 at age 19. The first modern day solar cell, one we would recognize, wasn't created until 1954 by Calvin Fuller, Gerard Pearson, and Daryl Chaplin at the AT&T Bell Laboratory. Today, Solar energy provides four-tenths of one percent of the total energy consumed in the United States for a total of 6,623 megawatts each year, with almost 60 percent of all solar panels being located in the state of Nevada. While 0.4 percent might not sound like much, solar has seen a 400 percent increase since 2010. As the efficiency of solar panels increase and the price to produce them decreases, solar power is becoming an effective method of reducing our dependence on fossil fuels and in turn reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Solar cells or photovoltaic cells are made of semiconductors. The primary material used in solar cells is one of the most common semiconductors, silicon. As such, silicon is an ineffective conductor because it has no free electrons when in a perfectly crystalline structure such as that used in solar cells. In order to create a solar cell that creates an electric current that we can use to power a circuit, we need a layer of n-type silicon and p-type silicon. I'll explain the difference between n-type and p-type further in detail in a minute, but all you need to know now is that the imbalance and valence electrons between n-type and p-type silicon creates an electric field when the solar cell is struck by photons. When high energy photons strike the solar cell, it excites the valence electrons of the n-type silicon, releasing them from their outermost shell, resulting in free electrons. The electric field created by the imbalance of valence electrons between the two layers of silicon then forces all of the free electrons from the n-type silicon to transfer across the junction and into the p-type silicon, creating the current necessary to power a circuit. Impurities are purposely added to silicon in order to allow for the flow of free electrons in one direction. The process of intentionally adding impurities is called doping. When silicon is doped with antimony or phosphorus, the resulting silicon is called n-type, n being for negative, because of the prevalence of free electrons. N-type doped silicon is a much better conductor than pure silicon alone. On the other hand, silicon that is doped with the element boron, which only has three electrons in its outermost shell instead of four, becomes P-type silicon, P being for positive. Instead of having free electrons, P-type has free openings and carries a positive charge. This causes electrons to flow from negative to positive, or in other words, from N-type to P-type, creating a current. Shown on the slide are the band gap energies for metal, semiconductors, and insulators. So let's just focus on semiconductors for now because that's what's used in solar cells. A big problem for the efficiency of semiconductors is the band energy gap, or in other words, the energy gap between the conduction band and the valence band. The valence band contains the n-type silicon and the conduction band contains the p-type silicon. Remember, n-type silicon contains atoms with extra valence electrons it's looking to get rid of. If the valence band is struck by a photon of the correct wavelength, that extra electron can then jump to the conduction band, which has free sites. And only when the conduction band contains the extra electrons can we create electricity. 
Now, the sun emits photons of a large portion of the wavelength spectrum, but because only photons of a certain wavelength have the correct energy to excite the valence electrons in order to knock them loose, much of the energy given off by the sun is lost. A photon of too low of energy, and it will simply pass through the cell as if it were transparent. A photon of too high of energy, and the extra energy will be lost. These two effects alone can account for the loss of about 70% of the radiation energy given off by the sun. My name is Brian Onsbach, and I will be discussing polymer solar cell efficiencies. Polymer solar cells could be a long-term solution to energy production with the development of low-cost production of these cells. For this to be effective, though, key issues need to be addressed like low efficiencies and the stability of the solar cells. The main issue affecting polymer solar cells at this time is their efficiencies. The efficiencies of polymer solar cells has risen to about 6% in the recent years, which still lacks behind inorganic solar cells. Polymer solar cells have been improving at a much faster rate, though, than any other solar cell. Three main aspects that affect the efficiency of a polymer solar cell include band gap energy difference, energy level of the highest occupied molecular orbital, and the design of the solar cell. The first topic that affects the efficiencies of polymer solar cells is the band gap. It is essential for the band gap to be reduced in order to harvest more sunlight by increasing the wavelength of sunlight that is captured. Lowering the band gap allows for more sunlight to be harvested because it leads to a higher short circuit density, which is directly related to the difference between the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital of the donor polymer and the LUMO of the acceptor polymer. The second topic to be addressed is the energy level of the highest occupied molecular orbital. In order to increase the efficiency of a cell, the HOMO should be at the lowest possible energy level. This is because it will increase the open circuit voltage of the cell. This increase in open circuit voltage allows the cell to harvest lower wavelengths of sunlight, whereas a higher short circuit current captures higher wavelengths of light. The open circuit voltage is limited, though, by the differences between the HOMO of the donor and the LUMO, LUMO of the acceptor. Optimization of both the short circuit current and open circuit voltage must be found in order to increase the efficiencies of polymer solar cells. The last crucial factor that affects the efficiencies of solar cells is the design of the solar cell. The cell works by forming an exciton, which disassociates, releasing an electron. In order for the solar cell to work properly, the exciton must reach the donor acceptor interface without undergoing decay. To improve the likelihood that the exciton reaches the interface, the donor acceptor contact area must be as large as possible. Furthermore, once the exciton disassociates, the electron must reach the electrodes. Without these key design features, the solar cell will not function properly. Keeping these aspects in mind, studies have been able to increase the efficiency of polymer solar cells in recent years. One study attempted to increase the efficiency of a polymer solar cell by increasing the open circuit voltage by changing side chains on the polymer. In this particular study, a carbonyl alkyl oxy chain was replaced with an alkyl chain. The polymers were synthesized and shows that the alkyl group lowered both the HOMO and the LUMO, which means that the band gap is relatively the same, but a more desirable HOMO energy level was achieved. The study next replaced a carbon atom with fluorine in the polymer. This again lowered the HOMO while keeping the band gap the same. 75 of these modified cells were then tested and resulted in an average efficiency of 7.38% with a high efficiency of 7.73%. This is an increase from the 6.1% efficiency of the original polymer cell. The open circuit voltage was also significantly increased, which further demonstrated a lower HOMO increases the open circuit voltage. Further research into changing side chains and functional groups can be conducted in order to increase the efficiencies more. Next, Ryan will discuss improvements to state of the stabilities of polymer cells. Thanks, Brian. My name is Ryan Benoit, and I will be discussing the lifespan of polymer solar cells. The main reasons for the dramatic improvement in stability gained in the recent years may be summarized as follows. First, improved photostability of the active polymer materials. 
Secondly, the advent of the inverted device structure. Third, the use of more stable metal electrodes. Fourth, improved morphology control. And lastly, an improved understanding of how each layer may contribute to degradation mechanisms. There have been many attempts made to improve the stability of the active polymer material. Originally, the main material used was poly-3-hexotheophene, or P3-HT, but this material photo-oxidized with complete bleaching after only 700 hours. Many more types of polymers were tested for their efficiency and stability, but a continuous problem arose with the side chains de decreasing stability. It was soon learned that by substituting simply achial side groups for tertiary achial ester groups, these side groups could be cleaved off at temperatures above 300 degrees Celsius, leaving the native backbone. This allowed for stability of upwards of 4,000 hours of full sun, or 1,000 watts per meter squared. One way to increase stability is through the use of an inverted device. Typically, the layer stack is built on top of semi-transparent indium tin oxide, ITO, with the whole transport layer, which is the polymer, followed by the active layer, electron transport layer, and some metal electrode, which is the cathode. In the inverted design, the layers are reversed. The inverted system changes the chemistry of the solar cell, which increases the stability. Usually, the normal geometry uses metals like aluminum or calcium as the electrode, while the inverted geometry uses metals such as silver. The typical aluminum and calcium films used for the metal electrodes are highly reactive. This causes a problem as water and oxygen react with the films, causing a layer of oxides, like aluminum oxide, that then become electrically insulating, creating a transport barrier that ultimately degrades the performance. This can be reduced by either fully encapsulating the device or by using a different material for the electrode. One that has worked is silver, as it is not prone to degradation by oxygen and water. Also, with a silver electrode, it is possible to print or coat emulsions with a high content of silver particles on the electrode, similar to screen printing. Stability of the organic solar cells has also been increased through morphology control. Through this, the polymers were created with the intent to reduce oxidation from water and oxygen. After the polymer was created, there were intermediate nitrine groups. When the polymer was heated to 140 degrees Celsius, the polymer was chemically linked with PCBM. This substantially increased the stability of the polymer. It is important in the research of stability of the polymer solar cell to understand the stabilities of the individual layers of the cell. If one layer is much less stable than the others, then the overall system will become inefficient rather quickly. Each layer needs to be equally stable, or the cell will only be able to be in operation for a limited time. By isolating the different layers, they can be tested solely based on that layer for stability, eliminating the variability of other layers in the cell. Hi, my name is Brendan, and now we'll discuss the advantages of polymer solar cells. Some of the potential advantages are flexibility, processability, low material cost, and independence on scarce resources. The flexibility makes storage, insulation, and transport easier. Solar cells can be rolled out onto a roof or other surfaces. They're also less prone to damage and failure compared to their counterparts. Traditional solar cells rely on vacuum deposition methods, which require a lot of energy. Molecules are easier to work with and can consist of thin films that are a thousand times thinner than silicon cells. This reduces the cost production significantly. The cost can also be reduced by using solution processes, print techniques, or roll-to-roll -roll technology. These methods allow organic solar cells to cover large services easily and cost efficiently. These methods also require low energy and temperature conditions to operate compared to semiconductive cells and can re reduce costs by a factor of 10 to 20. Many second generation solar cells use resources scarcely found in nature. Polymer solar cells can reduce this problem and avoid using air resources. Also the properties of polymers such as the ability to generate charges 
change the molecular mass, or change the length of functional groups, allow the polymers to be manufactured to fit virtually any desirable pattern or color. Polymer solar cells also have a few disadvantages. Two of the main disadvantages are the lack of durability and efficiency. They do not have a long lifespan. Silicon-based cells can last up to 25 years, where polymer-based cells only last about a year. Efficiency is also a main problem. Polymer solar cells are behind traditional technologies. The general efficiency is only around 5-6% to 6 compared to the 15% of silicon cells. Although they cannot replace silicon cells in the energy conversion field, polymer solar cells can be used for specific applications such as recharging surfaces for laptops, phones, and packages. They also can be used to supply power to phones or MP3 players. Other research and developments in military applications have shown that polymer solar cells can be used in soldier tents to generate electricity and supply other equipment at night such as night vision goggles or GPS receptors. Polymer solar cells may be a viable option in the future because of their low cost and their ability to be applied to almost any surface. This means it's a commercially viable option for decreasing our dependence on fossil fuels. That concludes our presentation on polymer solar cells. Thanks for watching.